Hello and welcome to the new episode of Human Progress Podcast. Today with me is Dr. Terence Keeley. He is an adjunct fellow at uh, the Cato Institute. And for many years, uh, he was the uh, president of University of Buckingham, uh, which is in England, Britain. And it is the only fully private university in that country. Um, he was educated at Oxford University and uh, is a renowned author on a number of subjects, but primarily his research on research and development and uh, what role governments play or should play or should not play in uh, uh, research and development. He has published uh, around 45 original peer-reviewed papers and around 35 scientific reviews. In 1996, he published his first book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, in which he argued that contrary to the conventional wisdom, governments need not, need not found science. His second book, Sex, Science and Profits, came <laughs> out in 2008, and that argues that science is not a public good, but rather is organized in invisible colleges, thereby making government funding irrelevant. He's also an opponent of breakfast and has a book arguing that people shouldn't partake in breakfast and that will make them healthier. But we are not going to talk about that. We are going to be talking about research and development, why is it important, what role government should play in it. And um, with that, welcome Terence to the podcast. Thank you very much, Marion. It's lovely to be here. Terence and I, um, I should say, um, are good friends. And there is a subject matter on which we have disagreed over the years quite very well. <laughs> that is the subject of Brexit. Not breakfast, but Brexit. Um, Terence was for the UK remaining in the EU. I was against it because I bought into the vision of Great Britain as a free and independent country that, is, uh, uh, that embraces uh, small government, open um, uh, economy, liberal economy. And um, I thought that was what Brexit Britain would look like. Alas, straight after Boris Johnson became prime minister, he embraced um, a man uh, by the name of Dominic Cummings. Dominic Cummings is a very, very smart and knowledgeable person. However, Dominic Cummings is also a grand believer in uh, government playing a massive role in research and uh, development, which made me think that perhaps future of Britain was not going to be small hands of government type, but instead it was going to be one where the government was going to play a much greater role than I could have imagined. And indeed, since then, that's exactly what has transpired. So what I want to talk to Terence about is that. But before getting into Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings and the future of Britain, I want to ask you, Terence, start by asking you, what was historically the government's role in research and development? And why is research and development important? Thank you. Well, the history is very revealing. Um, the continent of Europe has always believed that governments should fund science. And I say always, ever since basically Francis Bacon suggested that in 1605. What is very interesting is that the English speaking world, Adam Smith, and then latterly the United States of America, didn't believe that. And one of the great historical experiments is that between around 1650, roughly, and 1940, so about a 300 year period, you see continental governments funding science really very generously and the English speaking world, not governments, not funding science. And what's interesting is that the Industrial Revolution is first British and then American. So the history is very clear, very clear, startlingly clear, that the countries that fund science did not have an Industrial Revolution and the countries whose governments did not fund science did. Now, you ask why it's important. And it's very important actually to the, even to the current debates over globalization. Because the question is, how does a country, how does a community enrich itself? And the answer is through R&D, through technology. We today are richer than our parents were because we have, well, we have Wi-Fi, we have Zoom, 
we have all these technologies and these technologies come out of research and development. And therefore, the reason that we are all now so comfortable, as opposed to just two, three hundred years ago, when people basically starved as a matter of course, is because of technology and technology comes out of R&D. So R&D is important because it's the basis of modern rates of economic growth. And the empirical evidence is very clear that the government funding of R&D not only doesn't stimulate economic growth, but might even damage it. Fernand Braudel, the great economic historian, not a fan of capitalism or free markets, but in his book, Capitalism and Civilization, says, in a way, everything is technology. What separates us from people living 10,000 years ago, let alone people living 100,000 years ago, is technology. The resources that we have have always been there. Trees have been there. Iron has been there. Um, you know, copper has been there, but it's the amazing things that we can do with it, which make the present life so much better than the life that our ancestors had. When did people start appreciating that science is key to human betterment? You will remember the story of a man who brought unbreakable glass to Emperor Tiberius. And Tiberius asked him, did you share this knowledge with anybody else? And the inventor says, no, I haven't. And so Tiberius had him put to death because he was worried that this new technology would make precious metals uh, from which cups were made and what have you, that, that it would make them invaluable um, or rather it would deflate their value. So, so clearly people were suspicious of technology, but you say that in modern Europe and by modern, I mean, after 1650, things change. What, where did the change come from? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's the famous story. There, there are other similar stories, actually. Um, Queen Elizabeth I of England is said to have rejected uh, genuine innovators who wanted patents for genuine inventions because she was worried it would displace current industries and current people from their jobs. The, the realisation that knowledge is the source of economic growth basically starts in Europe around the year 1000. So you get, for example, the University of Bologna created nearly a thousand years ago um, as an institution designed to increase understanding and knowledge of particularly um, law, but similarly, very sim more or less the same time, other Italian universities arise, Padua, um, to create new disciplines in medicine. And soon thereafter, very importantly, we have Fibonacci, who in the very early 13th century introduces to Europe modern mathematics. He invents, or he rather, he imports the idea of a decimal point or of a zero, um, so that we can not only account in terms of accountancy of companies uh, more accurately, double entry bookkeeping, but also we can start to um, navigate our ships more intelligently. And so what actually happens from slow origins around the year 1000, particularly in Italy, where economic growth restarts, about a 1000 years ago, actually, as economic growth restarts in Europe after the long period at the end of the Roman Empire, with the invention of economic growth, because that's essentially what you see in Italy, the invention of economic growth, and then it goes to the Netherlands, and then it goes to Britain, and then it goes to America, and then it goes global. With the invention of economic growth comes at the same time, in fact, causing it, a respect for the idea of new technologies and new ideas. They come together. And in the early years in Italy, it was the free market that produced the early universities and the early uh, schools for navigation and mathematics. And then eventually governments nationalize these universities because they and the churches worry, just like your story of Tiberius, they worry that these dreadful people called scholars and researchers and merchants, very low standing merchants, would undermine the social order. And so there's this perennial tension. And eventually, and this is the sort of argument you get from Deirdre McCloskey, uh, which, and she's, I, I don't fully buy in her argument, but she's certainly not wrong. I just think it's more complicated than that. But certainly with people like Deirdre McCloskey explaining, you get to the point where merchants and commerce are no longer seen as the enemies of the established order, but rather as a movement that can be channeled by the established order to help enrich it and society. And at that point, you start to get economic growth really taking off.
Now, not to get too granular, but uh, can I push you a little bit on the thousand years ago? So it may well be that, um, you know, you have instances of innovation uh, a thousand years ago, like, for example, reading glasses, which I think are uh, developed in Europe around 1300, maybe maybe slightly sooner. But sustained economic growth and sustained innovation, that's the story of the last 250 years or so would, would you would you would you go along with that yes although um there's a very interesting scholarship coming out from a group of people um in the university of warwick in england and has been confirmed by other scholars such as mayor cohen in Dun in in dartmouth the reason sustained innovation is so rare is not that innovation doesn't sustain itself it's that nasty people called kings or bishops or barons come along and destroy it. Actually, innovation is quite easily self-sustainable. As long as you don't stop it, it becomes very sustainable very quickly. And Martin Ricketts and I, Martin's a professor at Buckingham, have written a couple of papers, actually, modeling this mathematically. Once you have a group of people inventing new things, then it becomes in everybody's interests to share in that joint invention, because you can't access the knowledge of other people unless you're yourself creating knowledge. You, Marion, or I uh, would have it, you know, we wouldn't be able to make a silicon chip. Uh, I can clone a gene, you probably can't. But the point is, only specialists can exploit new technology. I but once you have can't. a group. I definitely cannot clone a gene, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, I, I have. <laughs> uh, but I certainly wouldn't know how to make a silicon chip. Um, once you have a group of people who are creating new wealth generating technologies, it makes a lot of sense to join that group of people to learn how to do those technologies, to, to make your own new technologies so that you can join the party. And at that point, the whole economy becomes self-sustaining, which is what happened from initially, initially in Italy, but they got crushed. And then the Dutch, but they got crushed. And then in Britain, and nobody crushed Britain, basically because the English Channel more than anything, and also the fact that it was a democracy. But then, of course, government in Italy, the Italian city-states city and the Dutch provinces, it wasn't democratic, but those governments were representative within those city-states. So they had a sort of representative government that allowed merchants and innovators to take off. But what happened in Britain is that no one came along to invade us. That was the really important thing. And so the British created this huge technological burst that the Americans and then others took off. So the, the sustained technology is the key thing, Mario. But you get there not by encouraging innovation, because actually it comes together spontaneously once it becomes profitable, but stopping predators from destroying innovation. Joel Mock here, uh, an American economic historian, uh, wrote somewhere that innovation is an act of rebellion and that, um, um, you know, the, the problem with governments is that they don't like rebels. They don't like uh, people who object to the status quo. In other words, the, whichever elite is in power, they are very interested in keeping that power and they have a vested interest in status quo and technology is very disruptive to, to the status quo. And therefore, governments typically try to eliminate these uh, sort of pockets of innovation um, rather than rather than rather than promote them at least at least at least that was the historical case and I think that's also the point that Stephen Davies makes in his book about uh, about the importance of of, uh, of of elites in strangling innovation in the past is, is that basically what you're saying yeah, Mokir is, I mean, like Deirdre McCloskey, he's had a very real insight. It's more complicated than that, but he's absolutely not wrong. And in fact, if you look at the Italian city-states where it all starts, you look at the Dutch Republic where it then takes off, and then you look at England, actually, it's true that innovation is revolution. But in fact, it flows on the fact that the politics of these, the city-states in Italy and then the Dutch they themselves are born of revolution. So what actually happens, you, you, if you look at the history of Italy, you actually see, because Italy is very mountainous, so it's relatively easy for a small, relatively small community in a little valley behind mountains to keep nasty predators away. What happens initially is a group of quite modest people come together 
and repel in an act of revolution the Pope or the Duke or whoever it is. And these people are merchants and they're traders because that's what people are, because they're not barons. That's the whole point. They are the middle classes. And once having got their uh, rebellion against the king, they then foster trade within that community. So Mokir and Davis are absolutely right. Innovation is an act of rebellion, but the rebellion doesn't start with the innovators uh, as innovators. The rebellion starts with merchants as merchants, keeping away rapacious predators. And it's always geography. Italy became the heart of the new uh, industrial revolution back in the around 1100 AD because it was mountainous, so easily protected, and in the middle of the Mediterranean, in the middle of all the trade uh, routes. Equally, the Netherlands, behind those huge rivers, the polders, they were very difficult to invade and very easy to defend, and then England behind the channel. So innovation comes out of revolution. And indeed, innovation is revolutionary. And in a stable society, the revolutionaries are crushed. But the actual act of revolution is the creation of the city state or the province. And then innovation is released because the people running those city states and provinces have a vested interest in further innovation. If you're an Italian city state, you want your wool to be better than the wool generated in the Netherlands because you want to, because you're engaged in a commercial battle. So Mocha is quite right, but the, act, the, the, the initial act of revolution is actually political, not technological. And would you agree with me that the elite doesn't necessarily have to be just a king or a prince or a pope or whatever? I mean, it could also be bureaucracy. I mean, what we are seeing in the Western world, especially, is the str slow strangulation of economic growth through excessive regulation. Um, you know, I sort of think about the, the, the people who live in Washington, D.C. as the new American aristocracy. Americans are very proud that we don't have an aristocracy here. But in fact, we do. These are the permanent bureaucratic class, which is unaccountable, cannot be fired, very well compensated. Um, and, and they have and they justify their existence by churning out more and more regulations, um, um, laws and so forth which have a negative impact on research and development. Do the extraordinary that? thing is that guilds, which are basically anti-competitive cartels, but of producers, often quite modest men, there's always men in those days, I'm not being sexist here, it's just how it was, guilds of actually quite modest men and craftsmen are basically coterminous with markets. The moment you get markets, almost the first thing humans do is to create anti-competitive measures. And yes, the elites do it, but so do ordinary people in the guilds. And so the problem with markets from day one, essentially, has always been anti-competition, because once people have an established monopoly of some sort or other, they want to protect it from being undermined. The buggy whip manufacturers must have looked upon the motor car with great distress. And so uh, what Schumpeter called creative destruction is the basis of economic growth, and those people who are being destroyed don't look upon it kindly. Certainly in America, uh, and I'm English, so I must be careful not to pontificate in, in a way that may be seen as offensive, but certainly in America, one of the extraordinary things is this extraordinary rise of credentialism. If you want to be a hairdresser in Alabama, you've got to go to university for 20 years and have a PhD before you're allowed to set up shop. I mean, an extraordinary thing. But... Um, let me console you with this thought. This has always been the case. It's not unique to America today. Every country has anti-competitive measures that spontaneously arise, because that's just how human beings are. And B, if you, so there's nothing special about America. It's, it's always been that way. In a sense, it's a reflection of the strength of economic growth, that the strength of the anti-economic growth is so strong. But secondly, if you look at the simple GDP per capita data, GDP per capita is growing in America very strongly and actually probably at slightly increased rates every 20 or 30 years, the rate actually slightly increases. So it's so we can lament what's happening, but we needn't worry too much about it. Fundamentally, things look pretty good on the economic growth front. Okay, so it's in the Anglophone world, especially Great Britain, and then uh, in British offshoots, such as the United States, that we see the birth and the maturation of industrial revolution, new technologies, etc. And all of that is done without 
too much, perhaps, any government input. But that changes at some point. So how did we get from a place where the government was basically satisfied to let the market run, uh, innovators come and go, succeed or fail, to a place where the government is heavily involved in R&D? Can we quantify the government's involvement in R&D in the United Kingdom and the United States? And how did we get there? That's a very good question. Uh, we can quantify it and we can date it with astonishing accuracy. Um, the American government, basically, until 1940, did not fund research, development, or science. It just didn't. It had what was called mission research. So uh, there was the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard needed uh, certain basic uh, technologies. There was the Army, and the Army Medical Corps needed certain technologies. So in as much as the government took on certain functions in the United States of America, and I'm going to talk about the United States rather than Britain, because the United States is such a clear story. But Britain's the same story. It's just the United States is the major power in the world today. Uh, until 1950, the United States government did not fund science, except for particular missions, one of which was defense. And for political reasons we needn't go into, that we had no positive effect. One was agriculture. Uh, agriculture, you know, America was an agricultural nation for a very long time. Farmers were very poor in America. That was one of the great problems of America for nearly 200 years was poor farmers. And so they managed to extract benefits from the state, which did no, no, no good at all. All the big advances in agriculture came from the private sector. So let's forget agriculture, let's forget defense. But all the, the Manhattan Project and all that, all that was uh, the Second World War. And after the Second World War was over, the Office for Scientific Research and Development that you know, created Manhattan or penicillin, whatever, it was all disbanded. I mean, it's extraordinary how America was less safe in research until 1950. And the problem in 1950, when the National Science Foundation was created, was the Cold War. Truman had recognized by 1950 that America was at war again, this time with Russia. It was a Cold War, but in war, you need more scientists. You don't need them in peace. You know, In peacetime, the market produces as many scientists as it needs, for obvious reasons. But in wartime, you need to boost that. And so uh, with uh, Korea and all the other Cold War things beginning to happen, Truman creates the National Science Foundation as a wartime measure. And then in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik. It's funny now to think what happened. But in 1957, people thought Russia was going to overtake America economically and technologically, just as people today, lunatic people today, think that China is going to overtake America. It certainly won't, by the way. But forgetting China, uh, in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik. Soon afterwards, the Soviets launched the first dog that goes around um, the Earth in orbit, then the first human, Yuri Gagarin, goes around the Earth. And Americans all believe they're going to be nuked from space and will die. And this causes a real moral panic in the United States of America. And very, very quickly, within the year 1958, NASA is created, ARPA, later DARPA is created, and the National Defense Act is created, Education Act, sorry. But then there's a very interesting phenomenon, a really interesting phenomenon for those of us who would like to respect intellectual activity and sometimes find it difficult. Because this huge swamping of American government money into science came across an ideological problem. Because that was the Soviet model, just as before it had been the Nazi model. Does that mean that, that communism produces economic growth in the way that markets do not? Is that why the government... And so there was this terrible problem that arose in America, an ideological problem, that the American government was apparently copying communism. And it needed a solution. And this came from two economists in particular, Richard, Nera, Richard Nelson, sorry, and Ken Arrow. Ken Arrow won a Nobel Prize, not for this work, but as part of it. They came up with some beautiful mathematical models which showed perfectly that markets were wonderful at everything apart from research. That was the one exception. And so the American government should fund research, but needn't worry about giving any credence to communism for any other respect, because it was only research that was the public good. The models that Ken Arrow and Richard Nelson uh, produced were utterly fictitious. They deliberately, and deliberately is a strong word, but it's very hard to avoid that, mixed up arguments for what economists call classically competitive markets, with neoclassically competitive markets. I'm not going to go into the difference now, but a classically competitive market 
a sort of Schumpeterian or Adam Smith market is a very different thing from a neoclassical or marginal revolution market, which is a total fiction and doesn't exist, but is a very interesting mathematical tool. But if you're clever and you draw your arguments from the two markets, it's very easy to prove, as Ken Arrow and Richard Nelson did, that in a perfectly competitive neoclassical market, only governments would fund science. Well, that's the definition, by the way, of a neoclassically competitive market, <laughs> that governments have to fund science because it's a market it certainly won't. But we don't live in such a world. The world we live in is a classically competitive market that Adam Smith uh, or David Ricardo described. Uh, and in such a world, you don't need government funding of science. So anyway, endogenous growth theories, it's called, started around 1960 with papers from these two. And ever since then, the academic community has said, look, we have proved that governments have to fund science. Here are the mathematical formulae. Please fund us. And I'm afraid it's a 60-year-old scam. Endogenous growth theory, I regret to say this, the central theory by which economists describe economic growth is just a scam to make sure that governments fund universities, including departments of economics, generously. The, that is absolutely fascinating. We probably need to unpack this a little bit. But before going there, are you familiar with Eisenhower's uh, last speech? What was it? The Farewell to the Nation speech? A brilliant speech. So you, you take it over. Everybody knows when he complains about the military industrial complex. But there is a paragraph right below it which talks about the scientific complex. Yeah, and there's another paragraph where he describes how the government funding of science has destroyed the university in America as a center of free thinking. He says, in this brilliant speech, don't forget Eisenhower was president of Columbia University for four or even six years. I can't remember how many, but he actually knew about universities. He, he ran one, an independent one as well. And in the speech, he says it's a terrible thing. Academics are no longer judged by the quality of their scholarship. They're judged only by the size of their government grants. And this is a corruption of the modern university. We have lost the university as a center of thought, telling truth unto power. And we've turned it instead into an agency of the scientific military industrial complex by which academic scientists, government institutions, and large companies like the aircraft companies and the defense companies have all come together in defense of a model that is transparently false. And Dodgers Growth Theory, as we now call it, is transparently false. But the model says very comfortably, America will no longer be safe militarily, the American economy will no longer grow healthily unless the American government gives lots of money, not just to universities, but also to big industries. And in this complex, as he described it, it's just basically a scam. Just as, by the way, uh, although he didn't say this in his speech, but you could say the, the, the French Gothic cathedrals or the Egyptian pyramids were scams. The, the pharaohs assured the people of Egypt that they would only go to heaven if the pharaoh went to heaven and the pharaoh needed a big pyramid to give him a launching pad. And equally in the 14th century in France, the French kings and the archbishops persuaded the people of France that they had to impoverish themselves to build these big cathedrals, which also point up, or they wouldn't go to heaven either. Well, it's the same thing with the military industrial scientific uh, complex that Eisenhower exploded. The whole thing is based on a false assumption that only with the government funding of science will the American economy grow. Because remember this, between 1776 and today, the American economy has grown in a very steady way. In 1950 and then later in the 1960s, you get this huge, I mean, truly vast expansion of government funding for science in America and rates of economic growth do not change. It has been utterly exploded as a theory, but you never hear this because it's in nobody's interest to take. Well, just to finish off on Eisenhower, I, I mean, obviously, the 10 years between 1950 and 1960, I think he, he, he ends his presidency in 1961, must have been very different from what people are used to. The, the fact that he puts criticism of the link between science and government in his farewell speech, which obviously, you know, cannot go on forever. You cannot address all the things that you are concerned with. The fact that it's one of the main points in his farewell speech is, in my view, telling 
that it was something new, something unprecedented and something that he was really concerned about, but couldn't apparently didn't revert. Quite the contrary. It was completely new um, uh, in various publications that Martin Ricketts and I have written. Uh, I've described how um, employees of the NIH, National Institutes of Health or the NSF, describe going around to the universities, selling them research grants. The universities until 1950 were basically liberal arts colleges focusing on teaching and scholarship. They weren't centers of research. They were turned into centers of research by this flood of government funding. Equally, industry uh, until 1950 had been taught that it had to rely on itself, not on government handouts. But since then, it has become a huge begging bowl for government handouts. And Eisenhower was at that pivot. He actually saw it happening, which is why he recognized it, and which is why he made his very brave speech. You've got to be quite courageous to take on these huge vested interests. But of course, he was succeeded by John Kennedy, and Kennedy's obsession was getting to the moon before the Russians. He, he judged himself by that achievement. He, 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 unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to see it, but he absolutely set that off. And John Kennedy poured money into science because he wanted to beat the Russians. All that money, of course, was, was utterly wasted. We got no economic benefit from it. But it was Eisenhower who lived through that transition from America as a nation of free markets to America as a nation of corporate welfare he di- and academic welfare. He didn't like what he saw, and he had the stature to criticize it. But after JFK, it has become almost politically impossible to criticize the American government funding of science, because that immediately makes you persona non grata amongst practically every human being in the world. Let's go back just for a moment to the in, uh, endogenous growth theory. And uh, can you sort of explain it in very simple terms to uh, our listeners? And what, if any, role does the theory of public good play in, in, in the theory? And uh, how R&D fits into everything? Yeah. Endogenous growth theory says very simply this. It says the private market will not fund science because if I come up with some scientific advance, you, Marion, my competitor, will copy me more cheaply than it had cost me to make the innovation. So I invent a new form of technology, it doesn't matter what it is. I spent a fortune inventing it, but before I can get any return on my investment, you simply copy it and steal the market from me. And I've been impoverished by the R&D and you haven't, so you can actually then push me into bankruptcy. That's what endogenous growth theory says. And endogenous growth theory came out of the uh, theory, the world of economics. What is interesting is that no scientist has ever said that. Only the economists have said this, because it is simply a myth. The empirical evidence is overwhelming that actually it costs as much to copy as to invent. Once you can add together both the average costs of copying and the marginal costs. Let me explain what, what I mean by that. So to come back to our earlier conversation, if I clone a gene and you say to yourself, that's very clever, Terence has got a new technology there that's very profitable, I'm going to copy him, well, Marin, you won't be able to because you don't know how to clone a gene. So what you've got to do, first of all, is build up a huge R&D capacity in your own company by which you then are equipped to copy me. And by doing your own R&D, to get the tacit knowledge by which you can then learn from me, you then produce your own R&D. So the price you pay to copy me is the R&D you yourself produce, <coughs> which then in my term, I can copy. <coughs> and this is something that the economists have simply ignored. They have just pretended, and pretend is a strong word, but really it's not that inaccurate. They have pretended that the flow goes only one way, that anybody can copy anyone else, and therefore the costs only come from invention, whereas in fact, copying is as expensive as, as invention. And this has actually been shown by economists such as Mansfield or Gillikers or uh, Rosen, uh, uh, Nathan Rosenberg. But these disproofs are always ignored because this is empirical work that's tucked away into the research policy world, while the economists of endogenous growth theory ignore all the empirical disproofs and simply reiterate time and time again. So. For example, there is a book I've got in front of me here called The Power of Creative Destruction by Philippe Aguillon that came out earlier this year. And earlier this year, and Aguillon states quite categorically, 
science is a public good because it's easier to copy than to invent when it's just not true. Try copying without inventing. It can't be done. Fascinating. Patents. What role do patents play in making sure that the scientist, the Terence Keeley of this world, um, will pursue his passion for cloning genes? Um, patents are a scam. Patents, remember, came out of the medieval world uh, where everybody monopolized everything. In medieval Europe, people believed that if you invent, invested in anything, it didn't matter what it was, if you invested in anything, and then a mill, say a water mill or a windmill, and then someone set up another mill within easy distance of your own, that that was unfair because you'd invested in your mill. So it was wrong that your investment should be undermined by someone investing in their competitive mill and stealing your market. We no longer believe that. We now know that that is a false argument, that actually markets do very well by competition. Well, patents are, and you can see this goes all the way back to the Statute of Monopolies of 1624 in the English Parliament. In 1624, the English Parliament abolished all patents. The most extraordinary. Uh, in those days, 99% of patents were just for existing industries. So the whole of the soap industry or the whole of the salt industry was owned by one exploitative man, always a man, of course. In England, it was a shocking situation, which is why we had no industrial revolution in those days, because the moment anyone had anything, it was monopolized by a big man who went to the king, paid for the money, got the monopoly, and then killed anyone who tried to interfere with his monopoly. In 1624, all that is abolished, and that's when the English Revolution, Industrial Revolution starts, by the way, with the abolition of universal patents. But they made the one exception for patents for inventions, because they assumed that patents for inventions, unlike patenting pre-existing businesses, wouldn't throw people out of work, you would just create new things and therefore that would be very, very good. But the thinking behind it is exactly the same as medieval thinking. If you've done R&D, it's not fair. Mummy, it's not fair that someone comes along and copies you. That is a complete mythological argument. The reality of research is it's a collective activity. Even industrialists, people don't recognize this, even industrialists come together to do research jointly because research is very difficult and you can't make new discoveries unless you share. So for example, take the great American discovery of a hundred years ago, uh, the Wright brothers and the airplane. There's this big myth that the Wright brothers were these isolated uh, bicycle manufacturers in Dayton, Ohio, doing their own thing, inventing the airplane. Absolutely not. They exchanged well over a hundred letters with one of the major, uh, there was a network of, of letter writing and they sent well over 100 letters revealing the, the advances to date and receiving back from this network huge information that other people had done. They were absolutely part of a network because all major inventions come out of networks. And so the idea that you need patents to incentivize discovery is wrong because what patents do is they make it very difficult for people within networks to share knowledge because the whole point of patents is to stop people sharing knowledge. We are rich today because we no longer do what they used to do in the days of the alchemists, which is to keep research secret. We don't keep research secret. The moment we make a discovery, we publish it in a paper, we go to a conference, and even industrialists do this. There's a big myth that industry is secretive. Oh, no, it's not. Edwin Mansfield showed that within a year of a company making a discovery, all its competitors knew everything there was to know about that discovery partly because scientists from competitive companies are always sharing knowledge, partly because scientists move to other companies and take the knowledge with them, and partly because of reverse engineering. Companies buy each other's technologies and then reverse engineering. There is no such thing as industrial secrecy. There is only first mover advantage, constantly trying to keep ahead of the competition by constantly doing more and more R&D. Now, patents are a scam by which you try to stop doing more R&D. Patents are a scam, just like in medieval Europe, you went to the king, gave him a large sum of money and say, please protect my patent, my, my monopoly in water mills and kill nasty people building competitive water mills. So patents today are a scam by which you go to the king and say, look, I've done all this R&D, please give me a permanent monopoly and kill all my competitors. To which the king, if he's sensible, says, oh no, if you want to keep ahead of your competitors, now you do the next bit of R&D. And by the way, 
if you look at Microsoft and Facebook and all those big companies, although they do have patents and also copyright, they've often used copyright very successfully. What they really do is pour money into R&D to keep ahead of the competition. Markets absolutely incentivize R&D to keep ahead of the competition. And patents are a scam by which you try to kill the competition and therefore don't invest in R&D and just give the money to the shareholders. Thank you very much. So the argument that without patents, people would have no incentive to innovate, you don't buy that. What well, it's very simple. It's so what would be your incentive to clone that gene if you couldn't patent it? What, what, yeah. what benefit would you get from it? Yeah. Well, the answer to uh, the scientist or the company or the industrialist who says without patents, I won't do R&D. The answer is fine. Don't do R&D and see how long you survive before going bust, because it won't be long. You will go bust unless you do R&D. Schumpeter explained this very, very well. R&D is a totally defensive measure. If you don't do R&D, the competition come up with a new technology, you go bust. So to answer your question, there's a slight exception in pharmaceuticals, actually, just a slight exception in pharmaceuticals, because the regulatory burden in, in pharmaceuticals is so high that that is the one exception where you do need patents. But forgetting that for the time being, you asked me, why would you clone the gene? Well, the answer is this. Let us pretend that the, RN, that the gene is for an R, uh, a messenger RNA vaccine against COVID-19. What would be the incentive if you're BioNTech or Moderna to clone the gene for an R mRNA vaccine against COVID-19? Now, let me think. Oh, I know. Uh, trillions of dollars of profits is the incentive. And if you're worried about Moderna or Johnson & Johnson or uh, AstraZeneca competing with you, then what you do is you just make sure that the next reiteration of your patent, and by the way, there are new uh, variants coming out all the time, thanks to nature, that the next uh, iteration of your patent is even better than the former one. You can rely solely on competition. And the company, and you can actually see this in the pharmaceutical industry, the companies whose genes for COVID-19 vaccines failed, and many of them did fail, by the way, they haven't made a penny profit. But the companies whose vaccines succeeded, they are rolling in money, and deservedly so, by the way. And we have benefited. That. We have benefited. We have all benefited. That's how markets work. We've all benefited, but the inventors have benefited especially, and good for them. Agreed. Matt Ridley argues that um, we overemphasize genius insights that individual investors have on their own. It seems to me that you are arguing for something similar. Instead of emphasizing individual contributions to the growth of scientific knowledge, inventions, innovations, uh, you emphasize the, the communal nature of it all where you learn from dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of people. You are just the guy who puts it all together to come up with some sort of a small move toward the future. Is, is, is that how you see it? Or are inventors and innovators geniuses? Matt Ridley is quite right. Um, he, I mean, uh, this actually goes back to the scholarship of the great sociologist of science, Robert Merton. What Robert Merton pointed out is that simultaneous invention is the norm in science. What is usual in science is simultaneous invention. And the example Matt Ridley points out is that when Edison went to the patent office in the States for his light bulb, he went there in the morning, and that very afternoon, another inventor came to the patent office with their patent for the light bulb. That very afternoon, same day. At the same time in Britain, Swan was putting in a patent for the light bulb, and Matt Ridley has collated, I think it's either 17 or 27, simultaneous patenting of the light bulb across the globe. Every country in Europe, basically, there was an inventor patenting the light bulb that same time. And the reason for that is that research is communal. The whole point of research is that we're not secretive. The whole point of research is we all have the same information. We're constantly sharing information. The researcher who doesn't share their information finds that no one else shares their information with him or her, and so they get left behind. The most successful inventors are those who share their inventions most prolifically, so they get most ideas back, 
And then with a huge portfolio of ideas, they can then work out the best way forward. Invention is communal, it's collective. So the, and also, and this is something Matt Ridley and I share in common, Matt and I are both biologists. Charles Darwin, in his book, Descent of Man in Relation to Sex, pointed out that evolution through sexual selection, as opposed to evolution through natural selection, evolution through sexual selection is why we're creative. We are all creative. Creativity is normal. You've only got to look, and I'm just, I'm trying not to be sexist here, I'm just describing the most obvious example of creativity. You only have to look at the way women are constantly changing their makeup or their hairstyles or their clothes, because as, as Charles Darwin explained, that sort of creativity is how women, amongst other ways, of course, attract potential partners. And men do the same in, our, in, in different ways. And societies do things in different ways. Creativity comes from sexual session. We are all creative, all of us. Now, some people are undoubtedly more creative than others. Some people are braver than others. And therefore, some people make better entrepreneurs than others. But this is a normal human quality. Uh, Ant Anton House points out that uh, entrepreneurship and creativity can be honed and improved by different institutions. And that's true as well. Nonetheless, Matt Ridley is absolutely right. We all are entrepreneurial. We are all creative. We all have social ambitions. And in research, which is a totally shared activity, including between industrial competitors, do not let industries pretend that they don't collaborate with their competitors because they absolutely do. And this is a communal activity where people share knowledge and actually it just becomes a race. And the so-called genius is either the man or the woman who gets there first or, and it's only by a few minutes, or more often has better PR. And yet, when you look at, uh, when you look at polls, um, I, I read a paper some time ago showing that only like a, a share of population in single digits, maybe like three or 4% of people in Japan, in UK, in the United States, report ever to have innovated anything, changing anything. In other words, if, if innovativeness is common to all humanity, very few people actually innovate something that has any kind of impact on the welfare of human beings. So is, is maybe we are all blessed with being able to innovate, but only very few of us actually succeed. So is there something more to a successful innovator than, uh, than just the propensity to innovate, which you believe is a human um, characteristic? Well, uh, there are two answers to that question. First of all, people actually are more innovative just by adapting new technologies, and they recognize just adapting, just you know, learning how to use an iPhone, where before you used to write a letter, is actually a form of innovation because you're, you're part of a community of innovators. And if you look across the whole of society, we are constantly changing everything all the time. And we know that consumers are actually share the innovation because you get feedback from consumers. So Steve Jobs, for example, uh, defeated uh, the Swedish company, whose name I've temporarily forgotten, because he listened particularly to consumers who were telling him that they no longer wanted faster connections. They wanted broader connections. They wanted a, a computer on their iPhone rather than a better uh, uh, telephone. So consumers are part of that process of general innovation. But yes, of course, it is absolutely true that there are institutions that are dedicated to innovation and that some people are more innovative than others. Um, so I would argue, for example, and I'm, I'm absolutely not being sexist here, I'm just describing the most obvious example, that you can see that every generation of young women uh, adopt different fashions from the previous generation. In fact, on a yearly basis, fashions change in all sorts of things, clothes and shoes. This is a collective innovation. So no particular young woman may feel that she is part of fashion other than as a consumer. But in fact, by consuming and adapting to new uh, fashion, she's actually part of a community. Having said all that, it is, of course, true that certain people are particularly good at invention and innovation, just as certain people like Alexander the Great or Napoleon are particularly good at being generals. In every area of life, in playing 
sport, some people are better than others. And so, yes, there are some people who are better at the various skills required of invention and innovation, and they would then be attracted to the innovative company or the innovative university. Um, but actually, all humans in the West are part of innovative cultures, even though it's led generally by a very small number of people. And that's fine. That's fascinating. Um... The argument that people often make about the necessity for government intervention in, in innovation invention is um, look at all the wonderful things that we got as a byproduct of government spending, such as the Internet is a perfect example of that. Um, is it possible to quantify the cost benefit of government spending on R&D? I mean, just, 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 it's a question of probability. I mean, if you, if you throw a trillion dollars at something, uh, something will stick and eventually will produce um, a, a, will move humanity forward. Now, that's not actually a, uh, an argument in favor of government spending, because if that money could have been left in the pockets of the corporations or individuals, they, would, they, they could have used it differently and accomplished much more with it. Um, but that argument is difficult to explain uh, when somebody says, ah, but we got internet from the government. So what yeah. would be a good answer to that? Well, that's the Mariano Mazzucato position at the moment. Um, and it is a completely false argument. And the best way of that is to look at ARPA or DARPA, depending on which phase it's going through in its life. This is the institution that everyone says, you know, advanced research projects administration that's meant to have given us the internet and all sorts of other very good things. ARPA or DARPA has one consistent policy when it comes to cost benefit analysis. It will not cooperate or collaborate with anyone seeking to do a cost benefit analysis on itself, ever. It's one of its blanket rules. And that tells you all you need to know. And the reason for that is the phenomenon of crowding out. As it happens, Martin Ricketts and I have just had a paper accepted by Research Policy, which is the leading journal in this field, where we have mathematically modeled crowding out. But essentially, this is what happens. There are relatively few good scientists. I mean, you pointed out that only two or three percent of people really claim to be leading innovators. And, and that's absolutely true. But I want to come back to that because it's a very interesting point. Um, but let us say that of all scientists, and they themselves are a subset of humanity, within the whole community of science, only two or three percent of scientists are outstanding. And this is, of course, not surprising. How many painters are as good as Picasso? How many composers are as good as Mozart? How many writers are as good as Jane Austen? These are minorities within minorities. But if the government starts funding science, it always does it on the scientist's terms, because this is what peer review is about. So the government gives money to the scientific community, and then the scientific community distributes the money to its peers. Well, who will it give it money to? It'll give it the money to Einstein's, not Joe Bloggs down the road. It'll give all the money to the Einstein's, that tiny minority of really good scientists. So where do they all go? They all go to the universities, what we could call ivory towers, which means that industry is left with a second-rate scientist. And by the way, you can see that is clear. Obviously, there are individual exceptions, but unquestionably, the best scientists go to universities and only the not-so-good scientists end up in industry. And that's absolutely damaging because it means that industry hasn't got access to the top researchers it needs to make the discoveries it would like to make. Of course, if you pour, this is your argument, if you pour trillions of dollars into research, something's going to come out of it. But ARPA will not allow you to do a cost-benefit analysis because it knows, it's almost certainly done it privately, that the money it spends is less effective in terms of technology than that given to the than if the private sector hadn't had all this crowding out of scientists. Let me just come back, and this is why, by the way, rates of economic growth never go up when governments fund science. But let me come back to this business of innovation because it's very, very interesting about the 2 or 3%. One of the point I'm trying to make that we're all innovators. I think we'd all agree that the least innovative human beings on the planet are accountants, and even less innovative than accountants are actuaries. And yet, before the advance of public science, you actually had the actuarial profession making great discoveries 
such as high blood pressure gives you strokes or smoking gives you cancer. You have all these discoveries that the actuaries made just by looking at the raw data. This was long before epidemiology was invented. So even these least original of people come up with these great discoveries. High blood pressure kills. Nobody knew until the actuaries discovered that. So at this point, I'm trying to make that we're all part of a creative community. But to come back to the Mariano Mazzucato argument, of course, if governments receive trillions of dollars for research, they will produce something. But by so doing, they have pulled out of industry the best scientists, and therefore they are not doing work that is in, in, in society's benefits, because industry, of course, is always trying to produce goods that are valuable to people. They are, in fact, simply in an ivory tower, working purely for their own interests. And therefore, industry, by being robbed of the best scientists, underinvests in science because it's not getting anything for its money. And therefore, we are not seeing stimulation of economic growth. Yeah, but, but also presumably the money that the government spends on R&D must come from somewhere and to, the yes. extent, and to the extent that corporations could pay lower taxes and could keep more profits to reinvest in their own R&D but have to hand it over to the government, that presumably too will have some effect in terms of how much <laughs> companies spend on, on, on R&D. So let's conclude with China. Oh. Terence Keeley doesn't believe that China is going to overtake the United States and dominate everything. Why not? Well, this fear of China, um, I, I hate to sound conspiratorial, um, but this fear of China is, is, is a nonsense. I mean, Chinese GDP per capita is a quarter or a sixth, depending on which parameter you choose, of America's. This is a very poor country, of course, in total. Uh, it's as rich as America, but per capita, it's really very, very poor still. And by the way, as we've all seen in the last few weeks, the Chinese Communist Party has realized what we've all realized, which is the problem with free markets and the problem with innovative societies is that people become empowered and they start asking questions and they start asking questions of the government. And what we've seen in the last few weeks, just the last few weeks in China, is a huge crushing by the Communist Party of markets in education and technology and other hugely important innovatory areas of the economy. The Chinese Communist Party can't live with it. China is not a threat to America in terms of overtaking the American economy. It's simply not going to do it. It may be a military threat. It may be a geopolitical threat. But the idea that the Chinese system of no democracy and just the government directing the market in some sort of um, uh, well, direction of the market, that, that it's going to work any better than it did in Russia is simply not true. The, the dogma is actually true. The richer people become and the more healthy and brisk markets become, the more people find military dictatorship intolerable. And the Chinese Communist Party has got a dilemma on its hands. It's either going to be poor and therefore maintain a very <laughs> controlled society, or it's going to allow society to be free, and in the end, the capitalists will destroy the Communist Party. They will never be able to get out of that irreducible conflict. What is amazing to me is how short human memory is. Um, during the Cold War, when there was a competition between the USSR and the United States, a lot of academics argued we have to, in America, we have to become more like the USSR, precisely for the <laughs> reasons that you were mentioning, you know, Sputnik and all of that. Look how many scientists per million population the USSR producing as opposed to us. Look how much money they are spending on R&D and so forth. And yet what proved to be crucial really uh, to the success of the United States, to the winning of the Cold War, is that this was a centrally planned economy where completely, um, where people who didn't know anything, couldn't know anything because no person is that smart, were able to um, were able to move around industries and people like pieces on a chessboard and were able to send money, um, direct capital towards things which turn out to be unproductive and so forth. In other words, what, what won the Cold War was the fact that the Soviet system of central control, having just one or two people in power who made decisions as opposed to the... To the uh, to, to the market where where order is spontaneous rather than directed. Um, so that's what won the Cold War. And yet 
here we are just 40 years after the collapse, no, 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union having the same argument. Uh, why is China so successful? Oh, well, because, you know, it's centrally driven society and she can order highways to be built and great railways to be built. Um, in fact, I wouldn't want to be in Xi's shoes because he's going to be responsible for all the mistakes that the China is, that Chinese are making now and will be making them in the future. Well, I, I wouldn't worry about him because he's also changed the rules. So he's now president for life. Um, <laughs> but um, the important thing to remember is vested interest. The reason nobody is skeptical about these arguments is it's in everybody's interests that governments should do this in the West. So it's not just, of course, um, uh, the government funding of research. It's also the government trying to pay the economy. But just look at the government funding of research. The scientists love it because it means lots of money for them. But the industrialists love it. They believe, rightly or wrongly, that if they can get the government to fund R&D, they're getting something back for their taxes. Just as if someone came up with a clever argument by which they could persuade the government to fund their advertising or marketing or HR budgets, they would. But unfortunately, Ken Ayer hasn't got round to that yet. But it's just as cynical as that. Um, governments love funding science because the budgets are relatively modest, that they can claim all the credit. In the year 2000, who stood up on the podium and said, look, we've cloned the human genome? Bill it Clinton. was Bill Clinton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somehow Bill was there, you know, with his pets. Um, so governments take huge credit from it. And so all vested interests are aligned. And, it's and, and so it is with the idea of a centrally planned economy. There are companies like Halliburton, which used to be Brown and Root. You've only got to look at Carer's biographies of Lyndon Johnson to realize there are entire industries. This is what Eisenhower was saying, that exist only because of government funding. And these industries have a huge lobbying capacity to ensure that that government regulation of the market continues. It's only the occasional libertarians, such as us at the Cato Institute, that stand up against these massed vested interests. But our voices are very small compared to these huge interests. It's very sad. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at all those, what, 70 or 80 empty cities that the Chinese have built. Yes. Uh, cities, not, not buildings, cities that they have built. In fact, Bloomberg had a fascinating graphic yesterday which showed that there are more empty apartments in China than the population of Germany. <laughs> you know, and so you wonder underneath, underneath this, this shiny cover um, surface, what's underneath in the Chinese economy? What's going on? Where are the deep deep flaws where, where has the rot taken place um where where are the bubbles as a result of capital misallocation and when is it going to come to a, to, to a crashing end look, look anyone who believes in industrial policy you know is an idiot or they have a vested interest because they're going to get some of the money from the government china the chinese economic model is no threat to humanity however the Chinese military model, now that is a threat because it's an enormous country. It may not be very rich, but in total, it's very rich. I mean, if you were to tell me, is China a threat, a military threat to Taiwan? I would say absolutely, it obviously is. Is China going to invade Taiwan? I don't know, but might it? Absolutely, it might. Um, and that's where China is the threat. It's not the economic model, it's the geopolitical threat. And we mustn't mix those two up. So with that, Terence Keeley, thank you very much for spending an hour with me. It was absolutely fascinating, and I hope to get to see you in person at some point in the future, in the near future. You mean we're going to be allowed to travel again? I can't believe it. <laughs> when we are given freedom to travel, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I loved it. <laughs>